Happy Sabbath, everybody. You've heard of God's mercy and his grace. You know what the difference is? God's mercy or God's grace is giving you what you don't deserve. And God's mercy is not giving you what you do. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Father, I thank you so much for the story and scripture of Jesus and all that he did. And he'd love to continue doing it, repeating it in each of our lives. So as we listen and enter into the life of Jesus from so long ago, may it be transforming for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to call him Big John, and you can call him that too. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to meet Jesus? You know, if you'd lived back then, here he, well, Big John started life really well. Had a lovely home, lovely wife Mary. They even had a little guy they called Little John. And uh, everything was going fine, a good job, good income, neighbors and everything. And then Big John started living on the edge farther and farther from the right until the day came, a horrid experience, the demons took over. And when it happens when the demons take over, you lose your self-control. They made him do all kinds of things. Society banished him. They chained him. But, you know, the demons are stronger than chains, and they'd snap them. And finally, Big John lived in the tombs on the top of the bluff along the Sea of Galilee. At night, you could hear him. He'd take a sharp stone and cut himself, and he'd scream in pain. He'd cry. He'd moan. He'd wail. It was eerie hearing that at night. And as I picture this situation, parents used him to try to get their kids in line doing what they should. Son, you hear that? If you don't shape up, that's what you're going to end up like. I'll be good, Abba. I promise. I'll change. I won't. It was a morning. The storm of the night before had blown out. And... Here came a boat as it nosed into shore. Jesus stepped out onto the shore. The minute he did that, there was a screaming, like a banshee. Here came this madman charging down the bluff like he was going to eat them all alive. The disciples took one look and the hair on the back of their neck stood straight up. They dove into the boat grabbed the oars and stood. Uh, and, and then somebody says, where's Jesus? And they look, oh no, he's back with that madman. Jesus! Big John, really the demons. He was crouching in front of Jesus, just about as close as the demons could get. And he said, what do you have to do with us, Jesus, you son of God? I beg you, don't torment us. And something else, he said, please don't put us in the abyss. Don't torture us. Jesus let him blow for a little bit. And then he said, what's your name? Legion. You know what legion means? Many, many. Send us into the pigs. Send us into those pigs up there. And Jesus, have you ever wondered why they wanted to go there? I'll tell you in a minute. Jesus looked at him and said, well, go. And they went and almost immediately the whole pack of hogs charged down the bluff into the sea and were drowned. Well, the swine herds were, they were responsible. What could they do? They hightailed it into town as quickly as they could get there. And they talked to the owner and said, we, we couldn't do anything about it. 
they're all gone. They're, they're drowning in the water. The owners came with the swine herds and everybody else followed them too. And here, Big John is now dressed in his right mind, sitting there holding an intelligent conversation with Jesus. And now it's this, the owners that are begging Jesus, not the demons. They're saying, please, please, don't stay here. Leave, go. They were afraid they were going to lose everything else they owned. And now you know why the demons wanted to go into the pigs. They wanted the people to get rid of Jesus. Well, as Jesus started to get in the boat, Big John was like, let me go with you. Please, sir, let me go with you. And Jesus said, no. Go home and tell what great things God has done for you. And as the boat pushed off from shore and sailed off, Big John, life was instantly different. He'd met Jesus. Listen, if you don't like your life, all you need to do is meet him. Jesus, or, uh, Big John, climbed the bluff to the path that led home. Little John was playing in the air that day, and all of a sudden, he noticed somebody coming down the path. It didn't happen very frequently, but he looked. Oh, no, that's, that's Abba, which is the word meaning father. He went running for the front door. Mama, Mama, Abba's coming. Please save me. And he fled behind her and grabbed on for all he was worth. Mary looked out there. Sure enough, she went over, picked up, as I picture this, a rolling pin. And she stood there, little John behind her, cowering in fear. All he could remember from his father, Abba, Big John, was what the demons did. John stood there at the gate looking at Mary. How long it had been since he was home. And he couldn't believe how big that boy had become. Mary, I'm home. I'm really home. I, I met Jesus. He came in a boat. And he cast the demons out. They took the shackles off. And they found some things, <coughs> pardon me, they found some things for me to wear. And I wanted to go with him, but he said, no, go home and tell what great things God has done for you. Mary, God has done such wonderful things for me. And it's so wonderful to see you again. Mary, could you ever forgive me for what I put you through back when it all started happening? Mary stood there with that thing in her hand, eyes beginning to brim with tears. Could it be this was the man she'd married? His manhood was back. You know, church, think about this. How much power did John have? Could he deal with the demons? No. Could he change himself? No. Could he set himself free from the shackles? No. But he met somebody who could, who had the power, and that was who? That was Jesus. He could do such wonderful things, and he did them for John. And you know, I'll let you take it from there, the scene of what happened when he finally got home. But when Jesus returned to the Decapolis, everyone was really waiting for him.
One day, different story. One day, two men came up to talk to Jesus. They were messengers from John the Baptist, his first cousin. And he looked up at them. He said, may I help you? They said, well, John the Baptist sent us to you. And, and he, he wanted us to ask you a question. What's that? Are you he who is to come? Or are we supposed to look for somebody else? If I could have seen Jesus' eyes at that point, I would have seen a fleeting disappointment. He didn't answer. Instead, he turned to the people. The lame he healed. The blind he gave sight. The, the deaf mutes he gave their hearing and speech. And, and the lepers, I mean, would, would you have touched a leper if you'd lived back then? No way, not for all the money in the Roman Empire. But that's how Jesus healed lepers. Can you imagine what the touch of the Savior's hand must have felt to somebody who hadn't been touched in who knows how long? You know, some years ago, the state of California had a uh, health, public health campaign. For perfect health, you need five good hugs a day. I don't know when the last time you've had five good hugs in a day, but can you imagine what that touch must have meant to them? And Jesus healed the lepers and something else. He raised the dead. How did he do that? He had the power. And then he turned to John and he said, you go report, I mean to his, his messengers. He said, you go report back to John what you have seen and heard. The blind can see, the lame can walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf are hearing and speaking, and the dead are raised. And then in a gentle, gentle statement intended for John, blessed whoever, is not troubled by me. Now, we don't know how many people Jesus raised that day. But he said the dead are raised, so it must have been several that he raised to life. Now, there are three people that are mentioned in the New Testament. One was Jairus' little girl. And what he, his wife put him through before he finally said, okay, I'll go. And when he got there, he's worried sick. I waited too long, me and my pride and ego. Oh, Jesus came and raised that little girl. She was about 12. Another one was Lazarus. And as Mary and Martha both said, if you'd been here, my brother would still be alive. You need to listen to the song, Four Days Late. Four Days Late, wonderful message. Anyhow, the third one was the son of the widow of Nain. I remember standing on a promontory in Israel looking out and our guide was saying, right over there is Nain. We never went there. I would have liked that, but you can only do so much on a tour. Well, anyhow, as they approached this large group of people with Jesus and a large group of from the town following the men carrying the litter with that dead body on it, Jesus stopped them. And the poor mother, I mean, this is the only family she had and now she was absolutely alone. What was, what was she gonna live on? Nobody was there to provide. And Jesus put an arm on her, maybe he hugged her. He had a way of doing that. He says, don't cry, just believe. And then he turned and touching the foot, I picture it, 
of that poor boy. He said, son, wake up. And what happened? <laughs> he woke up and sat up in the litter and Jesus took him by the hand and brought him to his mother. How do you think she responded? Jesus' power to raise the dead did it again. She just cried out, oh, son, it threw her arms around him. And now she's still crying, but for a very different reason. And the people in the town, they said, oh, a great prophet has arisen among us. God has come to help us, his people. Now, as you sit here today or online, and you're thinking through this life of Jesus, the snapshots. Maybe you sense somebody you can't see is talking to you. It's the forces of good that have come to help you. Why do we ever resist the work of the Holy Spirit? or the angels, or we turn off things people are telling us. When heaven comes to earth, is to help us. Amen? Amen. And, they, you know, if, if you are somebody who, like Big John, lived on the edge and lost everything, Jesus has power to restore you, to set you free, to take the shackles away, and to restore your lost adulthood. Jesus can and will do that for you. Just ask him. And the day is coming when all the dead are going to be resurrected. Two different times. The righteous, and you want to be in that one, and the unrighteous, you don't want to be in that one. But God's power, Jesus' power, can raise the dead and he raised that boy. What a difference that made in that poor lady's life. Now, probably the best storyteller you've ever heard, although she's been gone for a while now, best storyteller Adventists ever had was Josephine Cunnington Edwards. She came and lived in our home for a week. We were in Ogden, Utah at that time. And from one end of the week to the other, it was nonstop stories. One of the stories she told, I'll just throw in extra. I'm a storyteller if you can't tell. Anyway, she was sitting on the back of a plane during a layover at a terminal. Everybody had left the plane and She's back there, quiet, minding herself. And all of a sudden, she looked up. Some fellas looking in the plane, and then he quickly sticks a package under one of the front seats, and then he disappears. And she sits back there. What's that package? I think I better do something. So she got up, left the plane, went to the, the desk where they have it beside each gate, and she said, I, I think you better look at this. Somebody just put a package on that plane. And they said, oh, well, thank you for telling us. They went, it was a bomb. She was instrumental in saving everyone's life on that flight, including her own. Those are, I mean, we heard story after story after story. One of the stories comes from Africa and about a little petite woman named Doriza Rachel. Good Christian believer in the Lord, Seventh-day Adventist. Her husband was a hard worker for the Lord and one day he up and died. End of her life, but she said, no, it's not the end. We're gonna pray this one, this man back. She got on her knees, but before she did that, she sent a messenger to the missionary. Come, come now, don't wait. 
And then she got on her knees and started praying. He came shortly and got on his knees beside her and started praying with her. The day passed. They prayed on. Middle of the afternoon. It's getting late. They prayed on. Finally, about sunset, it was heavy dusk. The missionary stopped praying to God and instead talked to the dead. He took her husband by the hand and he said, Brother, you've slept long enough. There's work to do. It's time to get up and get at it. And he started to pull him up and you know what happened? He got up. Jesus has the power to raise the dead. But in Ephesians 2, there's another kind of death. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, the Lord raised us. Are you lost in sin? Living a life that you know is wrong? but you can't do anything about it. You just don't have the power. You know what? You need Jesus. He can free you from it all. He can raise you from the living death that you're experiencing. I was home from college. This goes back quite a ways. Home from college and Wednesday late afternoon, my mother said, son, would you take your little, littlest brother over to where he plays his guitar so he can go over and play again? I said, sure. I think she was getting a little concerned because this was not an Adventist church. She was concerned about their influence on his beliefs. I drove him over. Well, they had a guest speaker that night. He was a missionary from Africa. And he started, I'll never forget the story, the, the sermon, or the story he told. He talked about Elisha and Elijah, how Elisha did twice the miracles that Elijah did. And he said, there's a fellow that I led to the Lord in Africa, did the same thing, twice the miracles that have happened through me. A fellow came to him and he says, Buana missionary, I was walking through the jungle and I heard the death cry. And I thought, I don't know where the idea came from, but I thought immediately, what an opportunity for God to do a miracle and raise the dead so that people can know he's stronger than their devils. So he went into the hut and here's this still small form wrapped in leaves and everybody is just in heavy grief. He stopped them, quieted them down, and he said, listen, you're in luck. I have come. I want to tell you about someone who can, a God who can raise that little tyke to life. Your devils can't, and they don't deserve your worship, but he does. He tell them about Jesus. And then he unwrapped that little form and put his hand down on a cold, still body. And he started praying. He told the missionary he didn't know how long he'd prayed, but he prayed and prayed and prayed. And all of a sudden, the body became warm. And as he looked around, he wanted to know, to know if anybody else had noticed it. And all of a sudden, his finger hurt. And he looked down, and that little guy with a mouthful of teeth had opened his mouth and bit down on the guy's finger. Yeah! And everybody, what? No question. The Lord had raised that little tyke to life. And as a consequence, everybody in the whole area had become a believer 
accepting and giving their life and faith to Jesus. Amen. Now, people today are lost in trespasses and sins, but the Lord can raise them and he can raise you if you need it. One more story from Jesus' life. Can't quit without this one. Remember, this fellow, he was paralytic, but he brought it on himself. And you know, there's no gift quite like grief. I mean guilt, right? Guilt does what? It keeps on giving. You put somebody into, on a guilt trip, and oh boy, they'll never, <laughs> until they're forgiven. Well, this fellow lived where Peter lived in that town. And four of his friends put their heads together and said, Jesus is here. Jesus can heal him. Let's take him to Jesus, okay? And they said, sure. So they made a litter, got some ropes, and they picked him up and carried him out and put him. He said, where are we going? We're going to go to Jesus. By the way, that's the best place to go, I think. Well, anyhow, so they picked him up and they carried him. They got to Peter's house and the I mean, the whole yard was crammed full of people. Everybody's quiet, trying to hear what Jesus is saying inside. Now, why couldn't they get in? Two reasons. One, there wasn't a lot of room in there. But two, the religious leaders had elbowed everybody out so they couldn't get in and hear and maybe believe in Jesus. They didn't know what to do. And somebody says, ah, up the ladder. So they went up the stairway on the side of the, the house and up there they tore the roof apart. I don't, if I was Peter, I don't know that I'd appreciated that at that point. Anyhow, they led him down through the opening they made right in front of Jesus. And it's amazing when the dirt started falling down, all of a sudden there was a lot of room there. All those guys were backing up. And Jesus looked down at this fella and he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And I think if the fella could have done it, he would have fallen <laughs> off the litter. Oh, why did Jesus say that to him instead of something else? Because he can read our hearts. He knew what this fella, you know, the Bible says nobody had to tell him. He knew what was in people. And he, uh, and of course, the religious leader, <laughs> did you see that? Yes, I saw that. Well, that's blasphemy. Who can forget but God alone? That's right. Nobody can but God. He's a black. And Jesus looked at him and he said, fellas, why are you thinking what you're thinking? What do you think is easier for me to do? Tell this man his sins are forgiven? Or to get up and walk? Now, before we take this story one step further, you got to realize, it, to answer Jesus' question, it's easier to heal somebody than to forgive their sins. Because for Jesus to be able to forgive what happened to him, he died on the cross. It's a lot easier to raise somebody off a sick bed than to forgive them with your blood. Anyhow, he said, I want you fellows to know I have authority on earth to forgive sins. Young man, get up, take your bed, and go. And he did. Jesus still has the authority and the power to forgive you for every sin you will have ever committed. Just ask him and just trust him. Now, there's a text that I want to give you. 1 John 1, 9. Say it with me. If we confess our sins. Start again. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When he gets done, what's left? Righteousness. Righteousness. So, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Jesus' power to raise you to health, to raise you to life, to restore you, to give you a new life, to give you a new you. But there's one more application that I don't want you to forget. This is in Ephesians 3, verse 16. There's one thing his power needs to do for you, you, for me. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Take it, keep reading. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Jesus has power and we need his power for this, to fill our hearts and lives with the fullness of the love of God. When we start living like that, what's it gonna do? What's gonna happen? You go to a mall, you look around. Have you ever just sat there and watched people go? Sometimes if they're a different color, or obviously a different wealth status, you kind of blow them away. But God loves every soul as much as every other soul. And Jesus' power will fill each of us with that love to where we look at people and everyone we see, we will love. And then, like with Big, J Big John, going back to him, what he did in the Decapolis, when Jesus returned, everybody was ready and waiting. And when we get filled, thanks to the power of Jesus, with the love of God, we will look at every person and love them into the kingdom. And when they look up, all of us, and see Jesus come, we'll be ready. Let's pray. Father, I do want everyone to know that through your power, you and I can have miracles and wonders, and we can be the biggest miracle of all. Jesus, your power is unlimited and the plans you have for us here in this congregation, if we could only see them, our hair would stand on end. We'd be so, wow. So Lord, this last point of being filled with the Father's love, Jesus, would you do that? Use your power to vest the Father's full love in each of us us, that we can get people ready for your coming, Jesus. Thank you. In your name. Amen.